Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Brenda Daly, Director of the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, and I am so glad you could join us to celebrate uh, excellence and distinction in the arts and humanities tonight as we honor our distinguished scholar, Dr. Mary Swander. Now, uh, her topic for tonight, as you may have read in the advertisements, the posters and the like, is spirit and food. Yum. We hope you will join us afterward for food and, if you wish, spirits. <laughs> Before that, however, I would like to tell you a little bit about what a distinguished scholar is, very, very briefly, before I invite uh, Dean Zimmerman to the podium to introduce our honored speaker. The mission of the center, as you may know, is to promote the arts and humanities at this University of Science and Technology. And as I just attended President Joffrey's uh, town hall, uh, where there was talk uh, with great excitement about bio-renewables and the bio-economy, I thought how very important we are in the arts and humanities to explore with our imaginations and our intelligence what are the social and ethical implications of a bio-renewable Iowa. What happens to the family farm, for example? What happens to the landscape, to the environment? So all of these things are part of our mission. The Distinguished Scholar Award, which we presented to a number of uh, faculty from different departments, from philosophy, from art and design, from music, uh, world languages and cultures, history, and tonight, English is an award that recognizes one of our Iowa State University faculty who has achieved distinction in his or her career. Rather than going on at length to explain what that is, I will allow Professor Swander to simply illustrate it wonderfully tonight. Uh, the award gives the uh, honoree a uh, one semester leave to work on a project uh, of his or her choice and the only expectation uh, to follow is a lecture and uh, or uh, perhaps uh, with Professor Swander a reading. So we're looking forward to enjoying that, enjoying that but first I would like to present uh, Mary Swander with a plaque from the center. It simply names her as the 2006 awardee of the Distinguished Scholar Award. Oh, thank you. And now I would like to invite Associate Dean Zora Zimmerman to the podium to introduce Professor Swander. Good evening. It's an honor to be able to introduce Mary Swander. And I'm going to start by doing that in a very formal way. I'm going to read a little bit of her accomplishments over the years, and I'm going to add a few thoughts of my own. Mary Swander's most recent work is a book of nonfiction entitled The Desert Pilgrim. And she's also known for her memoir called Out of This World. She's the author of three books of poetry, Heaven and Earth House, Driving the Body Back, which is the first one that I've heard, Succession, as well as a book of literary interviews called Parsnips in the Snow. She has edited three books, The Healing Circle, which is authors on recovery from illness, Bloom and Blossom, a collection of garden literature from Eco Press, 
and Land of the Fragile Giants, which is an edited collection of nonfiction and artwork on the Les Hills. And she did that with Cordelia Muto. The University of Iowa Press reprinted Driving the Body Back in 1998, and then she adapted, this is Mary, Driving the Body Back to the stage. And this piece, along with her co-authored musical Dear Iowa, with composer Christopher Frank, have been produced across the Midwest and on Iowa public television. Mary performs her own work and also gives solo readings throughout the United States. She is a regular commentator on WOI radio here in Ames, as well as on National Public Radio Sunday weekend edition. She has won numerous awards, including a Whiting Award, a National Endowment for the Arts grant for the Literary Arts, two Ingram Merrill Awards, the Carl Sandburg Literary Award, the Nation Discovery Award, and publishes weekly named Parsnips in the Snow, one of the best books of 1990. The Garden Writers Association of America awarded Swander her, the Quill and Trowel Award for best magazine writing of 1993, wonderful title. Mary Swander has published individual poems, essays, short stories, and articles in such places as The Nation, National Gardening Magazine, The New Republic, The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and Poetry Magazine. She received her MFA from the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. She's a professor of English, as you've been told, distinguished professor of liberal arts and sciences at Iowa State. She lives in an old Amish schoolhouse, raises geese, goats in a large organic garden, and she plays the banjo. Now I thought this profile had captured all of Mary's major work, but I was wrong. Her deep love for people in the land also led to her role in another volume called Home Ground. It's a 2006 Trinity publication edited by Barry Lopez and Deborah Gwartig. This volume is a collection of vocabulary that people use to characterize this country's landscape. It synthesizes geography, history, poetry, geology, and folklore to produce immensely satisfying definitions of physical features of our land. Mary contributed at least 17 of such definitions, ranging from Greenbelt, Iron Range, the Side Hill, and Sod, to Topsoil and Wood. And imagine my delight when I to finally learn about washboard roads. Let me share that one definition with you. And this is the volume. Travel down an unpaved road can turn into a teeth-rattling, bumpy ride that might send a car spinning into the bar ditch. Narrow ridges that spring up from the surface of the road in a wave-like pattern, resembling the metal ribs of a washboard, are usually to blame. Until the early 1960s, the washboard effect was thought to be the result of peculiar soil, wind from passing vehicles, car exhaust, or impulses from car engines. Then geophysicist Keith Mather set up a homespun experiment to determine the cause. He attached a small wheel to the end of a strut and then set the strut in motion, like the hour hand of a clock, to mark a circular path in a bed of sand. Regular corrugations appeared. The faster he spun the wheel, the faster the washboard texture developed. The prerequisite was merely a dry, rough surface. When a tire hits a bump, dip, or rock in the road, it hops into the air and crashes down, spraying sand and gravel forward and sideways to form valleys. The moving tire hits the valley and hops again, repeating the process. The next car on the road only makes matters worse. Route 66, commissioned in 1926, was one long, dusty washboard road, crossing the country from Chicago to Santa Monica until it was paved. Today, washboard roads are still found throughout the country on every kind of bare ground. I discovered those washboard roads here only in Iowa. I've not seen them anywhere else. And for 30 some years, I have tried to figure out how that effect is developed. And Mary discovered it. And so I am very grateful to, to your 
capacity in doing that. I think you can now also better understand, after reading that, hearing that little description of it, Washboard Road, how Mary's role in designing the new Master of Fine Arts program in the Department of English, the program in creative writing and the environment, uh, actually transpired. And of course, a very important part of that environment is food. So with no further development, no further development and no further delays, let us bring Mary to the podium so she can share with us her current work. And even more essential than food to the environment is spirit. Thank you. Spirit and Food. This, is, this talk is going to be about a new book, a work in progress, that will examine the sensual, sacramental, and social issues that connect spirituality and food in our culture. I'm trying to create a broad sweep across the country, looking at Rudolf Steiner Gardeners in Georgia, to a deer powwow in the Lakota Reservation in South Dakota, to the celebration of Ramadan in Portland, Oregon. I want to look at all traditions and all geographies. Each chapter will be framed around an interview of a really interesting personality who's actively engaged in the topic. And the first topic is healing with food. Um, I chose the personality of Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, an MD in New York City, and interviewed him for this chapter. Nicholas Gonzalez is a really interesting uh, character because he is an Ivy League trained physician, yet he's working with alternative medicine. His whole desire in life was to become the director of Sloan Kettering in oncology and treat cancer patients. Instead, he's ended up in oncology treating treating cancer patients, but doing it with food. And Dr. Gonzalez does it all through the manipulation of pH in the diet and other food substances. Now, when I listened to this, I thought, the manipulation of pH, which, you know, is the concentration of hyd hydrogen ions in the body, and it creates either an acid or an alkaline condition. I thought, he's using that to cure people of illnesses, not only cancer, but other degenerative illnesses. I thought, where did this come from? And it turns out that it was commonly used in medicine until the advent of antibiotics. For example, bladder infections are an alkaline, um, or an acid condition, and so they would use alkaline foods to cure them. But, so I went back to, you know, in about 1945 when antibiotics came into use, and I thought, this has to go back a lot further. It does. It goes back at least 4,000 years. In the Chinese tradition, I started looking at different traditions with the balance of pH around the globe. In the Chinese tradition, we have the balance of pH, although they don't talk about that at all, but in, in essence, that's what it is with the concept of yin and yang. And now it's traditionally known that yang foods which are heavy proteins, meat, poultry, fish, cheese, are yang foods. And they are warming of the human body. Yin foods are fruits, leafy green vegetables, and they're cooling of the body, yin foods. But I ask this question, okay, manipulation of pH, curing people with foods. I'm looking at spirit and food. Is there a spiritual foundation to this concept? In Chinese medicine, definitely. The spiritual foundation for the concept of yin and yang was a blend of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. And there was one central idea, which was qi. And qi essentially means life force energy. Well, to the Western mind, that is a little vague. And um, when I was in my 20s, um, I'd been in a car wreck and I had a lot of pain, and the, 
medical model doesn't really deal with pain very much, so I went to an acupuncturist, and I remember going in there just terrified of what was going to happen, and he uh, held my wrist and studied my pulse for minutes, five, seven minutes, and then um, examined me and pronounced me yin in the body, but yang in the head. And I thought, what the heck does that mean? I don't know. Uh, it means a lot in that system. That system comes from Taoism, which says that nothing from nothing came something. Instead of a creation myth, the way we might have in Western culture, Garden of Eden, so forth, there's no myth. It's just out of the void came chi. Chi is what first existed, now exists, and there's a mystical element to it, unites all of the universe. So when a person's chi is in balance, they're usually in a state of health. When their chi is out of balance, they're susceptible to disease in the Chinese system. Now it gets a little more complicated than that. The, the Chinese system, you know, it looks metaphorical to us, but it wasn't really to them. They had five elements that the chi moved through, and that was water, wood, fire, earth, and metal. And then there were 14 meridians, or pathways, that ran through the body. And you have to remember that this is before we had any anatomy and physiology. But interestingly enough, they ran through all the major organs of the body. And that's what creates pathways where we hear about acupuncture points. And that acupuncturist that I was working with was the head of the low back pain research team at the University of Iowa Hospital. And um, he was an acupuncturist. He was Chinese, but he was also a, a biomedical engineer. And he had mapped out all the acupuncture points on the human body. And it turned out that 95% like, of them were on top of nerve ganglia. So there is a definite correspondence that we can understand in our Western model. So how do the Chinese heal with food? balance of yin and yang foods. If your yang is out of balance, you get a little more yin food. If your yin is out of balance, yang food, diet, herbs, and acupuncture. And now to illustrate this point a little bit more for you, um, I have my wait staff here from my 306 poetry class, and they're going to come up and they're going to pass out yang foods on one side and yin foods on the other. So enjoy. All poets need how to wait table. <laughs> All right, here they come. All right. So we're moving from the Chinese. I began to move around the globe and ask the same question. Was there a manipulation of pH in any other cultures? 4,000 years, the Indian Ayurvedic culture had the same concept again. They didn't call it manipulation of pH, but they called it a balance of the human body. And um, the Taoist Chinese priests, there was an influence. They left China, traveled to India, and brought the concept with them. And you'll see it's very similar. There's some little differences. Five elements again. Elements are a little bit different. Water, earth, fire space and air, but again the mystical concept and mysticism, that word has a lot of stuff attached to it and basically all it means is everything in the universe is connected. So their concept is all is one creation and instead of chi there is the idea of life force or prana. Did they have yin and yang? No. Did they have two polarities? No. They had three doshas. And the three doshas controlled the human body. And in Ayurvedic medicine, it's really, you really have to spend a lot of time um, with the patient. It isn't, you can't do it in the 7.5 minutes that we have in the Western medical model to see a patient and then they're out the door. And there's no one size fits all, one pill fits all symptoms at all. It's, adjusting the individual's constitution and metabolism to create 
a state of harmony. Okay. So, three doshas. And all three are contained in one person. When, and usually it's a genetic disposition if one dosha is stronger than the other. And one, when one becomes very strong, um, then again you set yourself up for the advancement of some kind of illness. Vata keeps the body moving physically and mentally. And the people that are strong vata types are slender, energetic, compulsive, um, hyperactive, sometimes nervous, have insomnia or dizziness. Pita helps with digestion, and I love this one, the transformation of thought. These are usually people of medium build, intelligent, passionate, articulate. Their symptoms might be nausea, hives, rash, inflammation, and their personality uh, downfalls, anger, rage, jealousy. Kapha provides the body with structure and strength. These are heavier set people, but they're also they tend to be more loving and compassionate. Their symptoms, weight gain, tumor, edema, uh, psychologically attachment problems, greed, and depression. So what do we do with these doshas in terms of foods? Vata, we need warm foods, cooked foods, um, proteins, and vegetables. Pita, cooling foods to counteract that, you know, energy, um, sweet fruits, um, juice, leafy green vegetables. Kapha, they consider, have too much water, too much element of water, and so they give them dry foods, cereals, stews with beans, heavy foods, and bitter leafy greens. In the Ayurvedic system, there's also um, a sense of the tastes, the tastes of foods, and how those are in balance. Next, I asked myself, all right, so I've traveled around the globe, look at the Chinese, look at the Indian sense of balancing the pH. Did we have any concept of this in the Western world? Okay, let's go back to the Greeks. And in ancient Greek, um, they were believers in spiritual healing. You went into the temple, Asclepius, the god of healing, had shrines, temples built, him, and you went into the temple, you prayed, and you atoned for your sins. You brought offerings. Illness was considered a punishment from the gods. Okay? We know better than that in this day and age. We know about germs, we know about viruses, we know all of those things. But think about that for a minute, because that concept is still with us, that illness is a punishment from the gods. Um, I don't know how many times uh, when I've been ill, I have people call me up and they'll say, Mary, you, what, you must have done something really horrible in your past life to get yourself in this situation like this. And, you know, and after I recovered from the remark, I pulled back and thought about it intellectually. And what that is, is borrowing that sense of spiritual healing and bringing it up to the current time. The Hindu tradition of karma. What did you do in your past life? All right. So along came Hippocrates. And he was what we call the father of medicine. He said, let your food be your medicine, and your medicine be your food. And he thought that spiritual healing was a bunch of bunk. And what we really needed was some science put to the subject. And he was a great scientist. He drew up some scientific guidelines that we still have today. He said, first of all, you need to get the person out of the temple, get them to stop you know, burning offerings, and actually look at them, okay? Interview them, examine them, keep clinical notes and observations, and those should be meticulous and written down and detailed, and they should be confidential. And those are some of the premises of our doctor-patient relationships even to this day. It was very, very key. Um, he, interestingly enough, he tried to move away from the idea of spiritual healing, but what did he come up with in terms of the human body? Two polarities, three doshas? No. Four humors. <laughs> Okay, human beings, according to Hippocrates, are made up of four humors. 
black bile, blood, yellow bile, and phlegm. And as you can see there, each of one of those humors corresponds to an element. Earth, air, fire, and water. It also corresponds to a season. It corresponds to condition, hot and dry, cold and moist. And it corresponds to a personality type. Melancholic. I love the melancholic in this photo. They're <laughs> laid out in bed there. Yeah, they're just like totally down and out. Uh, sanguine energy. The angry personality of the yellow bile. And phlegm. Lethargic. Slow. Moving. What did Hippocrates prescribe to balance these humors? Foods. Soups and broths. And he worked on this really, really, really hard. He had really interesting combinations of soups and broth for the different uh, humors to balance them. He also prescribed, listen to this, very commonly prescribed until antibiotics again, exercise, rest, recreation, fresh air, change of climate, and herbs. He was a real proponent of herbs. We're going to move up a few uh, 100 years, and to a physician named Galen. And he is in now what's called, what's now modern Turkey. And he was a great um, anatomist. He really, really wanted to see inside the human body. And he ended up in Rome, and he was a physician to Marcus Aurelius. And, and he liked to go out and observe, observe the gladiators, um, not because he wanted to really help them. He, he was fascinated when they were torn open so that he could peer into their bodies and look at their muscles, and he uh, really gained a lot of knowledge from that. He, um, in Rome, picked up the ideas of the four humors, and he also invited spirituality back into the practice of medicine. So you can see by now, it's a pull and tug. It's a pull and tug. Spirituality, food. Spirituality, food in terms of, of herbs. Spirituality and food in terms of balancing the body. Galen's ideas, spiritual ideas, um, were that, listen to this, again, ideas that are still out there, we're still dealing with every day in our culture. There was a purposeful creator. Not sure how it all came about, but there was some purposeful creator that set it into motion. And what was set into motion? The pneuma, not the prana, not the chi, but the pneuma, air or breath, and that was connected to the soul. Well, the, the concept of the humors went traveling after that. And um, let's see, we're in, we're in Rome. And um, it, it, then Galen's ideas and um, text got translated. He was from, from modern Turkey. That translated into Syria. And then the Muslims, Islamic medicine, brought the concepts of the humors across the Mediterranean and into the Middle Ages and the Renaissance when um, European medical schools were prominent in Italy. They brought back to Italy, France, Spain, up into Germany. This concept of the humors by um, medi medieval European times was really integrated into the culture. For example, guess what one of the uh, main dishes was in Europe at the time? Sweet and sour rabbit. And uh, sweet and sour rabbit was supposed to be the perfect balance of the tastes and the humors. The dry carrots balance the sweet onions, the sugar, sweet sugar, balance the sour vinegar. In terms of Christianity and the church, again, an interesting dichotomy. The, uh, the church wanted to move away from the use of herbs because that was considered pagan, and so they moved toward spiritual healing and healing with relics, going back, healing in shrines, atoning for your sins, but at the same time, they embraced the idea of the four humors. In fact, Lenten fast days, how did they occur? Well, um, n probably not the way that you learn to, uh, 
to um, prop up the um, fishing industry in Boston. They, um, they occurred because on Latin fast days, we're encouraged to eat fish to make the character more mellow. The concept was that sanguine temperaments, the upbeat, um, nervous, kind of hyper uh, temperament, tended to get into trouble. And it became sinful. So take away that meat, cool out the personality, cool out the person, and it would strengthen meatless days were to strengthen moral character. Two polarities, three doshas, four humors. We're back to Dr. Gonzalez on East 36th Street in New York now. We've traveled around that far. And how does he work with foods? He works with 10 metabolic types. He has 10 diets, all different diets, with, as he says, 99 variations. One of the problems I think that we have today in terms of healing with food or even dieting is what diet do we go on? We have the... We have the um, high carbo diet, we have the high protein diet, we have the this diet, we have the grapefruit diet, we have the that diet. And um, we're all different human beings. We've all evolved differently and we've evolved in different places. And so according to the metabolic theory, we all have different metabolisms. Ray Tannehill in his book, Food and History, talks about different people evolving in different geographies. And so they select for different metabolic types. For example, in the Arctic, um, the indigenous cultures ate no fruits and vegetables. In our concept, that, they would die. That would be horrible. They'd have a terrible health. No, it wasn't true. They were in great health. They ate diets of 90% fat. Uh, they ate blubber. They ate seal and caribou. And they were in great shape. Conversely, in a climate, say, of Mexico that was hot and dry, did they need fat to heat their body up? No. It, I've always wondered why in hot climates people eat hot and spicy foods. It's cooling. They perspire and they need those kinds of foods in that environment. So the 10 metabolic types can be further broken down. And um, they're broken down into components of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. For you English majors out there, I'll just give you a little review of, um, of how the nervous system works. There's the voluntary nervous system, I can raise my hand up and down like that, and there's the autonomic nervous system that keeps me um, running and I don't have to think about it. My heartbeat, I'm breathing, I'm digesting food while I'm standing here, and I don't have to bring any consciousness to it. Well, the autonomic nervous system is broken down into two categories. The sympathetic, that reacts to stress, and the parasympathetic, that calms the body. And again, concept, think about it, yin and yang. Concept that um, we're both, all of us have those two systems going on in our um, human bodies. One system in some people genetically is stronger than another. Um, most people are balanced, but you can be born with sympathetic or parasympathetic dominance. This is the theory. Sympathetic has strong brain, anterior pituitary, thyroid, heart, bone, connective tissue, and personality. Active, full of energy, can be irritable, moody, short-tempered. These are left brain people, linear thinkers, they're good at math and science, morning people, and they tend to be acid. If they're highly sympathetic, they usually are high thyroid and can have slightly bulging eyes. Parasympathetic calms the body. They're much more lethargic, going to that end of the humors. They have low heart rate, low blood pressure, strong pituitary, hypothalamus, adrenal cortex, digestive organs, lymph, immune system. But they'll never be your great athletes on the Cyclones foot football team. They have poor muscle tone, slow, lethargic, but a good reservoir of strength. Personality-wise, they're more happy-go-lucky. They're more right brain, very creative people, but not as good generally in math. And if anything, 
they're alkaline, and because of that thyroid, they may have slightly sunken eyes. The key is to balance the two. All right, how'd Gonzalez come up with this idea? I thought he, he couldn't have um, just been sitting there in Sloan Kettering uh, in medical school and come up with this idea. Well, Gonzalez was a journalist before he was an MD. He graduated from Brown, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, in English literature. It's a good background for creative thinking. And then he went to medical school. He went to Columbia Medical School. He had, because he was a journalist, he had a lot of friends who were literary agents. He had a literary agent who came up to him and said, there's this crazy dentist in town, and he's got an interesting story. He's working with people with cancer, and I think there's a book in this. Could you go talk to him? Well, Gonzalez went out to lunch with him, and um, he listened to his story, and he said, you don't need a book written about you. What you need are really good clinical trials. And the man was William D. Kelly. And he was a dentist, and Gonzalez says, um, was he crazy? Yes. Was he a genius? Yes. And so he was one of the kinds of people in our culture is very eccentric, um, very odd, but yet an amazingly creative, smart thinker. He was a dentist in Texas, and he had one course at Baylor University in nutrition, and he, he, that really sparked his interest. He went into, became an orthodontist, and, and he began to fix kids' teeth, put kids in braces. And in dental school, the standard thought is that if you have crooked teeth, your parents had crooked teeth, and your grandparents had crooked teeth, it's a genetic thing. But what Kelly noticed was the kids were getting brought to him by their parents and grandparents, and they had perfect teeth. And so he began to question the premise of genetics. Sometimes it was true, but not always. So um, Kelly was a great researcher, and he went to he was this man was in Grapevine, Texas, which is outside of um, Dallas, and a, by himself he went to the library, and he found the work of Francis Pottinger. Pottinger was an MD nutritionist, and he had a TB sanitarium, and he was using um, at the time you know, again before antibiotics, so a lot of this knowledge was lost. He was using. Um, adrenal cortex for, to help his patients, and he was experimenting on cats. And what he noticed was his cats that he was using in his research were dying out, and he was feeding them processed food. And so he set up an experiment with 900 cats. I can imagine so many cats um, for 10 years, over the course of 10 years. And he had a lot of different groups. But basically, he had two groups. One group was fed raw food, raw meat, and raw milk and cod liver oil, and the other group had cooked and processed food, meat, milk, and the group that was fed raw food had no parasites, had great looking fur, they were healthy, had all, all sorts of offspring, reproduced easily, um, and had no degenerative disease. The one that was fed processed food uh, died out. The whole group died out. Um, the generation, successive generation, I think they reproduced two or three times and then died out um, from cancer and um, diabetes and all sorts of diseases. They had parasites, terrible fur, the whole bit. Pottinger came up with the idea, the hypothesis, that most degenerative disease had an autonomic imbalance. Back to the balance of the human body and the idea of the pH. Well, Kelly found another interesting researcher, and his name was Weston Price, and he was really, he was a dentist too, but he was really an anthropologist, and he traveled all over the world. He wrote a great, interesting book called um, Nutritional and Physical Degeneration, and he went from the Arctic um, to isolated villages in Switzerland to um, the Maasai in Kenya, and studied indigenous cultures who were eating their native foods, who were not eating anything but what their family has had eaten for years and years and years. And um, he photographed them and documented them, and, this, and again, this project went on for years and years and years. And what he came up with was that the indigenous cultures that were eating their native diet had broad dental uh, arches, 
very few cavities, some cavities, but very few, and very little degenerative disease. Then he would go maybe 15 miles away, same culture, same people, same geography, but these people are eating Wonder Bread, a white man's diet of white sugar, white flour, um, lots of marmalades and jams and things like that. And the next generation, succeeding generations, teeth began to become crooked, dental arches narrowed, increased cavities, and a big increase in degenerative disease, cancer, um, MS, tuberculosis. And one of the most interesting moments in that book is he goes to the Ar Price goes to the Arctic, and he interviews a doctor, a physician who had been up there for 30 years in a village that was eating white food. And um, TB was rampant. This is in the 1930s. TB was rampant then. And people would come to him from the adjacent village who'd been eating their native foods. They'd come to the village with white foods, get TB. And the doctor, you know, again, no antibiotics, no real way to treat TB, except, you know, they'd say, go out on a mountaintop and breathe um, clean air. Well, they were in the Arctic, so, you know. And he would, what the doctor would do was send these people back to their original village, back to their native diets, and often they would clear of TB. All right, I read that book carefully, and I kept asking the question, I'm looking at food, and I'm looking at spirituality and healing. What evidence do I see there? The Price um, made some really interesting observations. He found that in each of those cultures, there was a deep sense of spirituality, different kind of spirituality in every culture, strong physical bodies that match strong characters, and that the food was often, as in our culture, involved in spirituality. In that little village in Switzerland, um, it, the food would revolve around goats. So there's goat milk and cheese, and um, they made butter and made it into a candle and, the, and lit the candle for one of their key rituals during the year. So here's Kelly. He's down there in Grapevine, Texas. He starts to... Um, take his kids that come into him and change their diets a little bit to try to help their teeth. Everybody thinks he's wacky and crazy until his daughter gets terrible acute asthma. And again, medical model couldn't do anything for her and he thought, well, you know, maybe if I tinkered with her diet, it would help. He worked very hard on a diet for her. Her asthma finally eventually cleared up. And Kelly's an interesting guy because he didn't, you know, put out a uh, plaque in front of his office, you know, resident quack or anything. And he didn't really want patients. He was a dentist. And the other MDs in town began sending him patients and saying, you know, this guy helped his own daughter's asthma, you know, you should go to her. So he started um, receiving patients that weren't dental patients. Um, but as much as he knew about nutrition, Kelly was a junk food addict, and he uh, ate ding-dongs and ho-hos all day. And uh, <laughs> the ironies of this research are amazing. I just kept coming up with these things. And he, um, in 1962, he got pancreatic cancer. If you know anything about can pancreatic cancer, it's one of the worst. You usually have six weeks to six months to live. He had a terrible case. He, he, he felt ill for about four years before that. It went to the doctor and said, we can't find anything wrong. Finally, they said, yeah, you're full of cancer. Go home. There's nothing we can do. You're just, you're just filled with it. You're going to die. Write your will and be done with it. Um, he got really severely depressed. His wife left him, took the kids. He, you know, there he was dying by himself. And his little Irish mother arrived. And she just stepped into his house and said, what's with these ding-dongs and ho-hos? I mean, this is just terrible. And so she threw them all out the window and filled, um, filled the house with um, traditional Irish foods, oatmeal and, and fish and, um, you know, kale and um, vegetables like that, and fed it to him. And he, um, he started to feel a little bit better. But he had terrible digestive problems, as people with pancreatic cancer do. So he staggered down the street to the drugstore, and he brought, bought some pancreatic enzymes, brought them home, took them, and um, 
His digestive problems started to clear up, so he took some more, and then he raised the dose a little bit more, and um, a really, really strange thing happened. His um, tumor started to go down. And um, once again, Grapevine, Texas, he went to the library, and there was a book in the library that had been gathering dust for years and years. It was a book by John Beard. And John Beard was a biologist, an embryologist in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he wrote a book called The Treatment of Cancer, the Enzyme, in 1911. And Beard looked under the microscope, and he was studying um, the fetus, and he was studying the placenta. And he realized, even in, with a crude microscope of those days, he realized that the placenta acted a whole lot like a cancer cell in that it multiplied very, very quickly. And it could go rogue, and placentas do go rogue in women if they're not um, checked and they can become a huge tumor and kill the woman. And so um, he had a theory that cancer is merely misplaced, unrestrained placenta, which we now know as stem cells. Everybody thought he was nuts. Um, dismissed that because right at the about, you know, soon after that, Marie Curie came out with radiation and people started treating cancer with radiation. Well, um, Kelly um, thought that, Be that Beard's um, theory made sense because he had essentially discovered it on himself. And he um, got pancreatic cancer when he was in his mid-40s, and he just died a couple years ago at 79 years old. Um, so something, something happened there. Um, and then, again, these other MDs kept sending him patients, and eventually he started working with people with diet, supplements, and pancreatic enzymes um, in terms of um, working with people with cancer. Again, I asked, spirit and food, was there any sense of spirituality in Kelly's research? Well, he was a Southern Baptist, and um, in the South, that sense of Christianity infused everything that he did, everything that he thought. And so he had a real deep spiritual component in his program. In fact, then um, he had a seven-step spiritual program, and it reads just like the 12 steps of of Alcoholic Anonymous. So I asked um, Dr. Gonzalez, I said, so okay, so Kelly must have been an old drunk, right? He must have been uh, an alcoholic. Gonzalez was like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, look at that seven step thing program. And, and he said, no, 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 he made that up completely on his own. He never even heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. He didn't drink at all. And basically what it was, just like AA, except the fact you have this, take an inventory of yourself, and do something about it. And his overriding concept was illness allows time for reflection. Most of us don't allow ourselves much time for reflection to get ill. You're shunted away oftentimes from society, from your culture, even from your family, and you have time. You have time to think about what you're doing and where you're going. So Kelly retired, Gonzalez finished medical school. He studied Kelly's patients. He studied 10,000 of Kelly's patients. And he was under the directorship of the director of Sloan Kettering at the time, who really, really supported his research, and, you know, because it's out there. And he, he went down to Grapevine, Texas, and he thought it'd take him a week, and he could debunk um, Kelly's um, program he stayed five years, and Kelly kept meticulous records, and he went through all of his records. He went all over the United States interviewing patients, many of them still alive from pancreatic cancer, and um, concluded that there was something to the program, but it still needed clinical trials. He still wanted to study this in a scientific way. So he came back to New York, and he got a lot, a lot of flack um, for doing that, you can imagine. And in 1999, he did a study of his own, and it was published in a peer-reviewed journal called Nutrition and Cancer. It was on pancreatic cancer um, patients who had agreed to be in the study. 
And basically the gist of the study was if they had stayed on the program, they survived a much longer time than if and then comparable people who had been on chemotherapy. But Gonzalez kept pushing. That wasn't good enough for him. And finally you got um, our Senator Tom Harkin and Dan Burton, um, Democrat and Republican, interested in what he was doing. And a couple years ago he received the largest grant for any um, physician in alternative medicine, $1.4 million from the National Cancer Institute. And it was a grant for clinical trial control group, finally, he got what he wanted, control group and experimental group. Um, he said, look, study this, prove me a fool, and then we'll be done with it. Um, that's going on right now, and it's under the directorship of Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. What else is happening? Um, if you just tool through the literature, there are many, many things that all come back to this idea of food, and spirit, curing people treating illnesses. University of Michigan, there was a, uh, in 19, er, 2003, there was a study of breast cancer, and what they isolated with is they isolated a stem cell in breast cancer. They said, we've been attacking the whole big tumor, and really what the problem is, is a stem cell that's gone rogue. So healing with food. Um, at the end of my interview, I asked Dr. Gonzalez, so you dropped the Kelly spiritual component. When he went back to New York, he dropped all the seven steps and all those things. I said, so do you think that illness is completely physical, the balance of pH, or what's your theory? And he said, okay, look, I have 300 breast cancer patients, women breast cancer patients. 282 of them had an abusive alcoholic father. Put it together for yourself. And you can see in that scenario, physical, emotional, spiritual. He said, when I was working with Kelly, I asked him the same question. I said, so, do you think it's all physical? And, or what? And Kelly turned around to me and he said, it's 100% physical. I thought, oh, okay, then. This is Gonzalez talking. He said, a few minutes later, Kelly turned around to me and he said, it's 100% emotional. And then he said, about five minutes later, he turned around to me and he said, it's 100% spiritual. And Gonzalo said, oh, come on, what are you talking about? And he said, no, I mean it. It's 100%, 100%, 100%. And at that 100%, I will leave you tonight. And I want to thank uh, the Center for Excellence for Arts and Humanity, Brenda Daly, the wonderful introduction that I received, and all of you for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Let's eat. What do you say? I've got some books in the back, too, that I'm happy to sign for you. And there's wine and nice desserts. And um, let's have a good time. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>